coming down again. Welcome. And the king is coming. Amen. The king is coming. And he has a desire for every one of us is when he does come, he is to find us working. We're to be ministering. We're to be active in the fields. We're to be doing his will. And so today we are thankful, grateful that we begin this brand new week with this time of worship. And I want to say a welcome. So many of you now are on your way back uh, after this COVID season. Welcome if you're coming back for the first few times. But we have the Valentines here today, Randy and Gail. Randy went through a stroke a year ago, and he is back in the sanctuary with us, with Gail today. So praise God. We're so glad to have everybody here. Randy and Gail, God bless you. I hope you have your Bible with you this morning. I want you to take it and turn with me to one of the greatest chapters there is, John chapter 11. Open your Bible there. We are going to open one of the most monumental chapters in the Word of God because this chapter contains the climactic moment of Jesus' earthly ministry, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. We're going to study that in these next two sermons, actually. This passage of Scripture has so much glory and so much truth in it that my friend Sheila Wood, who is now in heaven, used to say that things give me chicken skin. And believe me, this is a glorious moment that you get to even preach on a passage like this. But up to this point, in the Gospel of John, the Gospel writer has recorded six miracles of Jesus. Chapter 2. John records the miracle of changing water to wine. Chapter 4, the healing of the nobleman's son. Chapter 5, restoring the crippled man's legs. Chapter 6, two miracles there, feeding of the 5,000 and also Jesus walking on the sea, coming to his disciples in the boat. And then chapter 9, healing a man born blind. Now, also in the Bible, today as we study, we're going to study the resurrection from the dead in these next two Sundays. Uh, we see that as a glorious part of this chapter. But also, Jesus raised two others from the dead as accounted for in the Gospels. In Luke chapter 7, the raising of the widow's son. And then in Luke chapter 8, uh, the raising of Jairus' daughter. That's one of my favorite accounts of Jesus' life as he takes that little girl by the hand and says, Talitha Kumi, my little lamb, arise. And she comes to life and sits up living once again. I love that passage of Scripture. But those two resurrections occurred immediately after those had died. The resurrection of Lazarus is quite different in that Lazarus had been dead for four days. And that makes this Jesus' greatest earthly miracle as he raises Lazarus after four days of earthly death. So I'm not going to cover the whole event today, which means you need to be ready to come to church next week. Because we're going to finish it next week, and I want us to keep this connected. So sign on with me to be here with me next week as we finish this passage. But we're going to cover a, a great part of it today. Uh, John chapter 11, verses 1 through 24. As I begin the sermon, let's start with verses 1 through 16. So hear these words. Keep your Bible open as we'll move a little further on uh, within the sermon. Chapter 11, the Gospel of John. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Martha which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. 
These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent that ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Keep your Bible open. We will go a little further. But as we think about these verses, Bethany was a, a little village adjacent to Jerusalem, about two miles away. And in that little town lived two sisters and a brother, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I want you to notice verse 2 reminds us of an act of Sister Mary. If you look at verse 2, chapter 11, it says, and it's in parentheses if you notice that, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So we see a little glimpse here of another act where Mary anoints Jesus. We will study that act when we get into chapter 12. We've not gotten there yet. John, the gospel writer, saves it till a little later in his gospel. But in verse 1, we see that Lazarus falls sick. He falls ill. And it seems that his illness gets worse and worse. In fact, the Greek word for sick in this passage is asthenio. And it's basically connected with weakness. With every passing day, with every passing minute, Lazarus was getting weaker and weaker and closer to death with this sickness. Whatever it was, it was leading him to death. It had spiraled downward so much that the physicians within the community said, there's nothing we can do. It's out of our hands. We can't help him. We can't fix him. He's going to die. What did Mary and Martha decide to do? Send for the only one who could offer help, and his name is Jesus. They immediately send for Jesus. He's not in the town. He is out somewhere in ministry. If you remember at the close of chapter 10, he had gone to the river of his baptism where John the Baptist baptized him and communed with his father. The cross getting closer and closer by the day. Perhaps he was still somewhere in that area, but we know he was about two days travel away. In verse 3, it's also very interesting how Mary and Martha tell Jesus that Lazarus is sick. And they're asking him to come. Remember that as Mary and Martha are talking to one another, and Lazarus is getting weaker and weaker by the minute, they're saying, we need to get in touch with Jesus, and we need him to come. But I want you to look at the message. Look at verse 3. Therefore his sister sent unto him, Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So notice, again, they use the word sick there, meaning he's getting weaker and weaker. He's passing away. There's nothing that can be done in an earthly sense. So, Lord, we want you to know our brother is sick, but what, do you notice what's missing? They don't ask Jesus to come. They don't say, Lord, the one whom you love is sick. Please come and help him. They don't ask. They simply give Jesus the message. He's sick. It's so interesting to me. Once, once you notice that, it's a, a glaring omission from their contact to Jesus out on his field of ministry. Why didn't they ask him? Why didn't they literally verbally say, Lord Jesus, you need to come. You need to help. They didn't ask because they knew they didn't have to. They knew the heart of Jesus. They knew he loved them. They knew he loved Lazarus. And if they simply sent the message, the one whom you love is sick, he'll come. We don't have to ask him to come. We don't have to beg Jesus to come. He'll come. Just send him the message so he knows what's happening here, and he will show up. We know his heart. We know that he's the Lord. Friends, it's still true for you and me. Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, but he loves you and me no less. He loves us. He takes care of us. And when we have a need, he will come. Amen? He will come. He will come to our aid. He will come to our healing. He will come to our need. 
He will give us the strength for the day. He will come. He will answer our request. He always will, 100%. He always will. That's His heart. That's our Savior. We can count on Him for that. Just as Mary and Martha did, we can count on Him. He will come. In John chapter 11, verse 4, as Jesus gets the message, you know it's really not news to Him. He knows. But look at verse 4, chapter 11. When Jesus heard that, He said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. As the Son of God, He knows all about this situation. He knows about the sickness. And Jesus said, this death is not permanent. I think that's, a, that's kind of funny, connecting those terms. This death is not permanent. Usually we think of death as permanent. Jesus said, this is, this is not something that's going to stay with Him forever. The death is not permanent. Our Father is allowing it so that God the Father can be glorified and His Son be glorified in what's going to happen in Lazarus' death. It's going to result in resurrection. It's going to result in joy. It's going to result in victory. And Jesus knows it's coming. Jesus knows it from that moment. So the statement is certainly true that we also live in victory. You know, I believe that's exactly why John included this snippet of Jesus' ministry in the gospel He wants us to see Jesus as the Savior. Remember, that's his purpose for writing the gospel. He said in chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, I want the world to come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is my witnessing tool. And so he's putting the the account of Lazarus in his gospel so that we know that there is resurrection, that there is joy, that there is victory. 2,000 years later, there still is victory. And that's why it's in the gospel as John includes it there by the inspiration of God Almighty. The lost will know Jesus. The saved will be built up in their faith that we can trust Jesus in all things. But with verse 6, Jesus doesn't immediately pack up and make the trip with his disciples to Bethany. He doesn't immediately leave his place of service and go on to Bethany in that moment. He tarries with his disciples wherever he was. We don't know exactly. But he tarries there two more days. Why is that? This family is in an emergency. They have sent for him to come. They want him there. They're calling for him to come. And he waits. Remember this. God's timing is never wrong. God's timing is never wrong. There's a holy reason in God's timetable that Jesus waited two days in this event of life. Now, be sure to write down in your notes today, God is never late, and God is never early. But as the choir has sung before, God is an on-time God, and He's going to show up at exactly the right moment. Not early, not late, but right on time. Sometimes you and I might think He comes late. You know, I've, I've made many a prayer, and I've come before the Lord many a time saying, Lord, where are you in this? Why am I waiting? But he never comes early. He always comes on his time knowing that he's going to bring about what we need in our lives, the healing, the strength, the power. He's always an on-time God. I'm thankful for that. But I know the reason Jesus waited two days. When he got to Bethany, Lazarus had been dead and buried four days. And Jesus waited because he wanted every person in that little town of Bethany to be 100% sure that Lazarus was dead. He didn't want anybody saying, well, Jesus strode into town and he resuscitated a man who had faded away. Jesus wanted it known that Lazarus had died. Four days later, he comes into town. The obituary was out of the paper now. Old news that Lazarus had been buried in the tomb and was gone. John chapter 11, verse 7, after the second day, Jesus says to his disciples, now it's time to travel. It's time for us to go to Bethany. In verse 8, the disciples say, Lord, you know you have a death sentence on your head. 
the last time you left Jerusalem, the scribes and the Pharisees had stones, and they were ready to kill you. They were ready to murder you. And you want to go back to that area, back to that place where there is a sentence on your head, and you want us to come along with you? Are you sure, Lord, you really want to go? I want you to look at John 11, 9, and 10. Because here's Jesus' answer. He said, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Well, those words that Jesus are speaking here are kind of a saying of the day. Basically, they meant most people do their work in the daytime. If they're working on the farm or they have a little shop, of course, you know, lighting was almost non-existent in the day, a little oil lamp perhaps. But when the nighttime came, all, everything had to shut down. People couldn't work in their fields after the dark set in. People couldn't run their shops after it got dark because there was very, very little light within their shops. So Jesus is referring to a saying of the day that you do your work in the daytime. When the daytime is over, pack up your stuff, go home, get ready for bed because the night has come. You can't work anymore. Jesus refers to himself there and that he says, it's not night in my life yet. It's not night in my ministry yet. The light is still shining. I still have time. Jesus knows the cross is very close. The cross is closing in to a week now. But he said, there's still light. And the Father is still allowing me time. And I still have the opportunity to minister because the light is still shining. There's still time before the cross. And God is going to protect me because I, I'm on his timetable. And it's not time for me to die yet. It's not time for me to go to the cross yet. So God is allowing me that time in his light and on his timetable that I can continue to minister. Let's go, gentlemen. Let's go. We're under God's protective hand here. It's not time for me to die. So as they get up to go, the old disciple Thomas speaks up. We love Thomas. You know, Thomas in the Bible is called Didymus, which means twin. So somewhere probably in Thomas's life, he had a twin in the world. But also, as you read the word, you know that Thomas was the doubter of the group. He was the guy who always saw the negative side. He was the guy who always saw the glass half empty. But Thomas is thinking here, Jesus is a wanted man. Jesus has a death sentence on his head. And so Thomas speaks up and says, well, guys, let's go on with him. If Jesus dies on the trip, so will we. So let's just go on and get it over with. And that's kind of Thomas's reply. Let's just go on and do this, whatever might happen. How'd you like to take a trip with Thomas? How'd you like to have him on your ministry team for three years? Jesus did. Jesus picked him. Well, let's go a little farther in Scripture. Go to verse 17 of John chapter 11. So they're traveling, coming into town. Verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that he, Lazarus, had lain in the grave four days already, now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Mary, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And that's where we're going to stop today in the study of Scripture. We'll pick up with that glorious verse of 25 next week. But as we think about Martha meeting Jesus. Jesus and his disciples are walking that dusty, dirty road coming now into Bethany. And the funeral and the burial had taken place four days ago. Everything was done. The tomb was sealed up. However, because it was four days out, most likely around the edges of that sealed tomb, 
the odor of decomposition was seeping out. Four days would put a body into a full gallop of decomposition. And even though everything was over with the funeral and the burial, typically in that day, people would stay a number of days and minister to the family. So Bethany still had many visitors in it who were taking care of Mary and Martha and looking after their grief. They were obviously well-loved in this little community. And I think this is interesting. Mary and Martha are such an interesting study. They're so different as sisters. You may remember an introduction to Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. Jesus goes to their house, and Martha is busy. She's busy all the time. She is cooking, and she is serving, and she is sweeping up, and she's fluffing the pillows on the couch to make sure everybody is served, and everybody's comfortable, and everybody's happy, and she has a constant blur of motion just going back and forth in the house while Mary simply sits at Jesus' feet and listens. If you remember, Martha said, Jesus, can you get her to get up and help me a little bit? I love those sisters. But one of the things I want you to know is they, there's no criticism here. God just wired them differently. God made them as different women. Here in John chapter 11, we see those same personality traits News comes to Mary and Martha that Jesus and his disciples are walking into town. And Martha gets up and she leaves the crowd in the house and she charges out of the door. She says, I got to go. Jesus is coming into town. I got to find him. I got to talk to him. And so she, that, pers- that, that, that personality drives her out to talk to Jesus. She's got to get to him and she's got to move on. While Mary contentedly sits in the house and doesn't move. And she just thinks, he'll come, he'll get here, I'll wait. So one has to go, but the other chooses to wait. So Martha is the goer and the doer and the type A personality. She's always keyed up, always has to be doing something. Mary is the contemplative, waiting, patient sister. Again, I'm not criticizing either of them. That's just the way God made them. And I love how Scripture shows their differences and I look at the present day, and I can tell you between Gwen and me, we're a Mary and a Martha. I'm Martha, always keyed up about something, always got to be on the move about something, fixing something, doing something, don't want to go to bed right now, I've got another little project I want to get done. And Gwen, Gwen is never flustered, and she's always patient, and nothing gets under her skin. She's amazing. She drives me crazy sometimes <laughs> because she's so calm. But I, I want to say this to you. She's taught me a lot in 38 years. My old keyed-up personality has learned a lot from the contemplative, godly woman that God gave to me. I've learned a lot from her. In fact, she's still trying to teach me after those 38 years. Bless her heart. But in my mind, I see Martha, and she is striding up to Jesus, and she is in a hurry because she has to talk to him. And she makes this huge statement, but it's a statement of trust because she, because she says, Lord, the word of ultimate trust in the Savior, Lord, I believe you. I love you. You are my Savior. I trust you, Lord. She said, Lord, if you had just been here, if you had just come a couple of days earlier, my brother would not have died. I believe you, and I trust you. I'm just sorry for your bad timing. Sorry you didn't get here soon enough to help us. And Jesus says to Martha, your brother will rise again. Of course, you know he's referring to a resurrection that is going to take place in a very few minutes that day. But Martha doesn't connect that at all with a miracle that's going to happen that day. Rather, Martha gives an answer of faith. She says, oh, oh, I know, I know when God consummates history and brings everything to a close that we will rise again. I know my brother is going to rise again. 
But as we end Scripture today, she doesn't have an inkling of the miracle that's going to happen in just a few minutes when her own brother is going to walk out of that tomb that held him for four days. Well, friends, the best is yet to come in this sermon. Don't miss next week. Don't miss the next one. But as we end it today in scripturally, as I close, I want to remind you of three major truths. Three major things that I picked up from this little passage of scripture. I pray you'll carry them along with you. First of all, number one, no matter who you are, you are like Mary and Martha and Lazarus in that Jesus loves you. He loves you no matter who you are, what color you are, what country you're from, no matter your background of sin, no matter what you've done in the past, no matter the baggage you carry along with you, Jesus loves you. Amen? Jesus loves you. He loves every single person on this earth. He gave himself for every single person on this earth because he loves us. That is the obvious truth, and it's number one. Truth number two. God's timing is never, ever wrong. He's not early. He's not late for his will to be done. Believer, you and I might not always understand his timing, but it is a matter of faith that we need to say, Lord, I believe your timing. I believe that you will come at the right moment. I believe that you will resolve this issue or bring the healing that's needed in your time, in your way, and by your might. There's never a doubt that Jesus is going to show up at exactly the right time. Here's truth number three. Listen, God still gives you and me unexpected miracles. When Jesus spoke of resurrection with Martha, she didn't know what he was saying. She didn't understand that the miracle was coming that day. The miracle as it came would be very unexpected to Mary and to Martha and to the community who will witness it. Friends, Jesus is still in the miracle business. Amen? And he's still in the unexpected miracle business so often. God still loves us, and there are little miracles and big miracles that happen around us all the time and every day. This morning, when you opened your eyes and got out of your bed, there was a little miracle of God right there. Because God gave you and me another day. But with that little miracle comes a commission, and that is don't waste this day that I'm giving to you. And part of the way that you are using this day wisely is that you're right here. You're streaming with us. You're hearing the Word of God and allowing it to touch our minds and our hearts and inspire us and inform us to take the gospel into the world this week. Don't waste the day. A little miracle is just getting up. But there are big miracles that happen in our lives, and we can't miss those miracles. Friends, I had never been truly sick a day in my life, truly sick a day in my life until last October. And I want you to know, in one moment in the emergency room, a doctor told me, you're so full of blood clots that if one had moved to your heart, they'd have found a dead man in the chair the next morning. But I want you to know, I'm so thankful for good doctors and good medications and good staff at the hospital, but the great physician healed me. Praise God. He, I am, praise God, he heals me. I'm standing before you today with full lung capacity. I'm standing before you with 100% assurance of good health, and it's, it's because of good doctors, good nurses, and medications, but it's because of the great physician that led the whole miraculous process to bring me back to this place. And I know that every day that I live is a gift that has been given to me. I know it. He's assured me of that through that big miracle in my life. So when miracles come to you and me, don't explain them away. Don't sidestep them with some earthly explanation. Yes, God gives us good doctors, and yes, God gives us miraculous pills and all of those things, but God is still work at work in the miracle business. It's God who brings the miracles, and we need to give Him the glory for everything that He does in our lives and in our healings and in our walk with Him. We give Him the glory. We give Him the honor. We give Him the praise for giving us every day of life and every miracle of serving Him.
Believers, we, we know the old hymn, Count Your Blessings. Today I'm going to redirect you to count your miracles. Where have the miracles been in your life that's gotten you to this place? Count your miracles. Because Jesus was in the miracle business 2,000 years ago at the tomb of Lazarus. He's still in the miracle business with you and me. Don't sidestep that. Still miracles are happening in your life and mine. Here's the greatest miracle of all. That Jesus came to save all people and that he himself, as God himself, laid down his own life on a cross, shedding his own blood and literally dying there so you and I wouldn't have to die. The miracle of forgiveness through a Savior who went to the cross for us. The miracle of the promise of eternal life to every believer because Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He's resurrected from the tomb. And that gives us the assurance that we too will live forever. He's still the God of the greatest miracle. And the miracle of salvation is open to every single person. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've had a miracle poured in your life. Don't ever take it for granted don't ever be ashamed of it. Don't ever hide it. Don't ever hide the name of Jesus. Live for him. Represent him. Witness for him because the greatest miracle was given in your life. But today, if you're here or listening and you've never come to Jesus as Lord and Savior, you've never put your faith in him, you can say, Lord, I recognize the greatest miracle is that you died on the cross for me to take my sin away. I come to you with faith, and I come to you with trust, and I come to you to say, I want you to be my Savior. I want to be your son or your daughter. I want to be saved by your grace. I want to be promised eternal life through your resurrection. I need you. I can look back in my life, and I've seen so many ways that I've fallen and not followed you. Friend, you're not alone. All of us have been there. If you need him today, don't wait. Don't put it off. The greatest miracle of the universe is waiting for you right now. A Savior with his arms wide open who says, I will receive you as my own if you'll come to me. Doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, or what you've done. You come, and I will save you. Will you do that today? If you're streaming today, will you do that today? Maybe you're not sitting in a, a church sanctuary. Maybe it's a kitchen or a living room. You can be just as saved in your living room as somebody can be saved in a sanctuary. Just come to him. Give your heart to him. Give your life to him. Say yes to him. He's waiting for you. Believers, as we leave here, just carry with you the truth. Count your miracles. Because many have been poured on you and me, little and big. If you need Jesus as your Savior, come for the greatest miracle of all. Come to him. He's waiting for you. Church home, whatever you need, he meets us here. Let's pray together. Our Father, our God, thank you for these precious minutes that we share together, Lord. Thank you for worship. Thank you for this awesome, awesome word of God, Lord. When, when I come to a passage like this, I, I never feel like I've done it justice. But I pray, Father, that you filled in the blanks and you've given this passage the glory that it needs. Thank you, Father, for being a miracle worker. Not just 2,000 years ago. Don't let us read this passage and see something that happened and it doesn't apply to us. <laughs> you still work your miracles in our lives. Help us never, ever to forget that. Little ones and big ones come to us on a daily basis. Today, Father, for my brothers and sisters, believers, may we count those miracles and be thankful. If there's one who needs you as Savior, I pray he or she will come. Whatever the need, Father, thank you that you're here to meet us. We love you. We praise you. We thank you in the strong name of Jesus Christ.